Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm a tech philosopher and the founder of Impeak. My guest on today's podcast is Donald Hoffman, a cognitive psychologist and popular science author and a professor of cognitive sciences at the University of California, Irvine. Donald is probably best known for his TED Talk and popular book, The Case Against Reality. Many of you probably know that I'm deeply interested in understanding the nature of reality and its relationship with technology. In particular, my hunch is that maybe we are living in a simulation, but there's so much more nuance to that hunch. Perhaps it's better if I say less and let you listen to this conversation with Donald Hoffman for yourself. Donald, when uh, we had the confirmation that you will be on the podcast, I uh, tweeted, uh, uh, you may have seen it, I tweeted that I was super excited uh, for this conversation. I've been a big fan. I've read um, your book. I have listened to all of your podcasts. I would say of all the different things that I've done in life, the one topic that interests me more than anything else is exactly the topic of your book, you know, the nature of reality. I remember when I was like literally four years old, uh, you know, and I remember it uh, where I would I would sit in front of the mirror, look at myself in the mirror and I was like, wow, like, what is this? Like, why do I have this, uh, you know, these sensations, these feelings? And I used to close wow. my eyes and like literally, um, you know, imagine myself sort of like going back in time, you know, going back, like taking a step back and, and thinking what is uh, like, where was I before I was here? I felt like I really felt like I must have been somewhere before I was here. I've had some really, uh, really interesting experiences. Like, for example, when I was, again, four or five years old, at that time, we didn't even have a TV yet. This was, I was born in Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. And, you know, we didn't have, like, we didn't have anything. And I used to uh, have this dream where I would uh, pick up like a notebook, you know, like this, I would pick up a, a book or a notebook and it would turn into a screen. Um, and many, many years later, when I saw an iPad, I was like, oh, like I was having a dream about an iPad, essentially, you know, like before, you know, so this is just like a, a very small part of kind of like some of the experiences I've had. So I've always had a feeling that uh, reality is not what we see uh, or feel that like, you know, if you think about what is like when you eat, uh, you know, what happens in your brain, it's all electrical signals in, in your brain. Um, and I went on uh, to invest in a bioelectronic company. Um, I was literally actually just using their product before this conversation because I had some pain from running and I'm fascinated mm. by the, the fact that, you know, that our bodies are more electrical uh, than chemical even, you know, like we think of ourselves as organic beings, but so much of our body is electrical. And I'm constantly exploring this idea of electrical signals, you know, and electrical connections creating uh, the reality. So I, I wonder whether we are already in a metaverse and now we are creating a new metaverse, you know, like, like if we are if we are creating characters in the metaverse and we are going to create these ai agents in the in the metaverse like what's to say that we are not ourselves in a metaverse you know of yes. someone else's creation well that's a great question and i think as a scientist the direction i would head with it is to say well what does our best science have to say about that question and Two of the pillars of modern science are, of course, physics, the quantum field theory and gravity, Einstein's gravity, and then also evolution by natural selection. And the physicists for the last almost 20 years have been saying space-time is doomed. And by that, they mean that space-time taken as the fundamental nature of reality, that idea is doomed. Space-time is perfectly fine as whatever it is, but it's not fundamental reality. So the idea that that space-time is fundamental and that's the you know, start at the Big Bang and also the reductionist attitude that comes with that, that because space-time is fundamental, as we go to smaller and smaller uh, scales in space, we'll come to 
more and more fundamental laws and more and more fundamental particles, and that's going to be a deeper and deeper reality. Well, the physicists have discovered that their own theories tell them that space-time itself has no operational meaning beyond what's called the Planck scale. And it's not that deep. It's 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, not 10 to the minus 33 trillion centimeters, just 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. All of a sudden, you can't make sense of space and time anymore. They have no operational meaning. So it's a very, very shallow data structure. The physicists have been working on what's behind space time. And they're finding stuff. They're finding the amplitudehedron, cosmological polytope, and, and sociohedron, and other, other geometric structures beyond space time. So the idea that space time is fundamental was a useful heuristic for, for many centuries. <clears throat> and now it's over. So there's something on the other side of space time. So all of a sudden, now we're getting into your metaverse kind of thing. So space time isn't the final reality. There's something beyond it. So how do we how do we understand what's outside what we can perceive? So we can think now of space time as like our headset, a virtual reality headset, and it is our metaverse. That's what the physicists are saying. Space time is not fundamental. There are these structures beyond space time, and space time is in some sense a projection, just like you would expect. It's a projection of something deeper. Well, evolution by natural selection agrees. And this is work that I've done with my colleagues and students, uh, Justin Mark, Brian Marion, and and, and others that I've worked with on, on this, Jaton Prakash, where we have discovered that evolution can answer a very simple question. Have our senses been shaped to show us the true structure of reality or some of the true structure of objective reality? Right, so reality might have some mathematical structure to it, like something called a total order, like one is less than two, is less than three, is less than four. All those numbers are totally ordered. So suppose that uh, objective reality had a, a total order structure like that. What is the probability that evolution by natural selection would shape us to see that structure so that our perceptions truly perceive that structure? And so we can, it, it turns out you might think, well, that's the kind of question you'd ask uh, Friday night with a beer with a bunch of friends, but you know, that's not a precise question. It's anybody's guess. And it turns out, no, it's not anybody's guess. Evolution by natural selection is, is mathematically precise. We have evolutionary game theory and graph theory. So we use those tools. And, and it turns out that uh, the, the answer was deeper than I expected going into it. I, I didn't expect this deep of an answer. But the answer basically is that the, the fitness payoff functions that guide evolution, that guide the evolution of our sensory systems, uh, almost surely don't have information about the structure of the world. So the very thing that would shape our senses does not have information about the structure of the world, almost surely. So, so it agrees with the physics that, that what we're perceiving in space and time, in objects in space and time, isn't the fundamental reality. It's, again, something more like an adaptive fiction. From an evolutionary point of view, surely our senses have been shaped to be adaptive, to guide adaptive behavior. And but to do that, we don't see the truth. We have a headset which hides the truth and simplifies things in, in ways that are useful. So I would say the answer to your question, um, we, we don't have to really speculate. Our best science right now is telling us that space time isn't it. There's something beyond space time. Evolution tells us that space time and objects are just a good adaptive fiction that are guiding behavior. And physics is, is the science that is going beyond space-time and, and making the first concrete forays into what's behind the headset. So science is now marching on beyond, beyond the headset, but right now it's baby steps, right? We don't know what's beyond. We have baby steps like the amplitudehedron and cosmological polytope. And evolution by natural selection tells us nothing about what's beyond, right? So, so, so it's really, and, and by the way, neither does you know, quantum field theory and general relativity. They tell us their limitations of space time, but they don't tell us what's beyond. So the physicists have to make, they're making a bold leap. These, these, this new generation of physicists are jumping beyond space time, postulating these structures and then saying, but if we project it back into space time, we better get the physics that we know and love. Otherwise we're wrong. So, so the current physics is telling us whether our theories beyond space time are worthwhile or not, right? Because if we can't get back what's in our metaverse, if we can't get back what's inside of our headset, then we're wrong. So we have to postulate things outside of our headset 
and a projection into our headset and it better show us what we see in our headset. So that's how the physics is going. And that's how I'm also trying to proceed um, with the work I'm doing beyond space time. That's fascinating. So um, there are uh, two things that I'd like to shed light on for, for a lot of people listening to this. Some people might think, why does this even matter to me? Like you said, you know, a lot of people will think, oh, this is just something to sit down and, and speculate, uh, you know, over a beer, right? Um, the truth is that, well, first of all, it's like the whole thing about the, the meaning of life, like, you know, like w w if, if this, if the reality is not what it looks like, then why are we here? What is the meaning of it, right? The second thing is maybe on a more practical level, if we can figure it out, then maybe we can manipulate it. You know, like that's the bit that's like super interesting to me. Uh, maybe we don't need to build spaceships to get to Mars because like if I'm Elon Musk, I'm not going to put my money into building spaceships to go into to Mars. I'm going to try and solve this problem because because if we can find out the nature of reality, then everything from like, you know, people who are trying to solve aging, people who are trying to solve, you know, so many other problems uh, or questions, but that maybe it, all of those problems will go away when you um, change your paradigm, right? And like you said uh, in your book, and you know, a lot of places you have mentioned this uh, example of if reality is not as it seems, why don't you stand in front of the train? And you said that I don't stand in front of the train for the same reason that I wouldn't drag the uh, work that I've done my Word file into my trash can on my desktop, right? So, so for the same reason, you know, so, so yes, I know that like right now we are still, you know, uh, from the viewpoint of where we are right now and what we are experiencing, yes, we are aging, yes, we are going to die. But um, if we can figure out if time and space are not fundamental, and if we are indeed in a simulation, essentially, then like, I want to know that, like, if you are in a simulation, it doesn't mean that it takes anything away from your experience. You know, you can right. still have an amazing experience. And my gut feeling is that we are in a simulation um, and, and that we are now creating a new simulation as we go into this world of the metaverse and AI. And I wonder how deep it goes and, and that our simulation is in another simulation, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I don't know the, rea the nature of reality, but when you look at um, fractals, you know, like when you look at nature, everywhere in nature, I see signs um, that there is like repetitions, uh, like the cells in your body, you know, like your, uh, the cells in your body, they each have their own life, uh, you know, and then they die and then they get recycled and then new ones come, come out and then you die. And like, it's when you look at, when I look at a picture or a, like, a, you know, these old videos of like black and white videos of people running around from like a hundred years ago, you know, whenever uh, the first camera was created, like 70, 80 years ago, you know, when you look at those and you think all of those people are probably de dead now, right? And, and yeah. you can think of yourself as being like one of those, right? Like when you look at pictures of people in the past, and like sometimes I see pictures in like Persian poetry. I'm uh, originally from Iran. I see like these pictures drawn, right? And sometimes I see like my own, like my eyebrows, you know, my eyes, right? In, in those, in those uh, paintings, in those pictures. So it just makes you think there is an experience of life being created on a philosophical level, you can ask the question of why is this experience created, you know, and what is the meaning of it? And then on a, you know, more scientific level, you can think of if we can figure out if, uh, if the nature of reality is not as it seems, um, you know, then maybe we are chasing the wrong problems. Well, I, I completely agree with, with both motivations, trying to understand what is the meaning of life and why, why are we here? You know, the, the issue of whether space time is fundamental or not is very, very important in, in understanding that. And also, I agree with you on the technological side as well. Uh, right now, we know that most of the galaxies that we see um, are not reachable through space time. They're, they're going away from us too fast. So there's all this real estate out there that's smiling at us and waving at us, and we can never get there going through space. 
But as you said, if, if, if we can reverse engineer the space-time headset and find at least some of the levels of the software behind it, I mean, I'm not saying we'll get all of it to begin with, but can we find some levels of software behind our headset? If we can do that, then we might be in the position of, if you think about someone who's say a, a wizard at playing Grand Theft Auto, say a virtual reality version of Grand Theft Auto, and this, this wizard can drive the car you know, remarkably faster than anybody else and make all the right turns and so forth. But if, if you're, if you know the software, then, then the wizard does nothing. You can, you can take the air out of the wizard's tires. You can take the gas out of, you can change the geometry of the roads. So we may, if we understand the software behind space time, we might not have to go to Alpha Centauri through space. We might be able to go through to Alpha Centauri around space, and then we wouldn't need rockets. We would just, but it, it won't be, it, it wouldn't be necessarily like wormholes. It might be something completely different. Something so we don't have to be stuck inside a notion of space time in, in our in our conceptions. The the amplituhedron, for example, that the physicists have found, um, is is entirely beyond space time. And it has new symmetries that you can't see in space time. So tell me more about that. So what's your hunch then, um, if if it's not through space time? What's your latest understanding? I'm working on a theory of consciousness, and I should say how my, my theory differs from uh, the standard simulation theory, for example, of Nick Bostrom and, and and people like that. So there's a big difference between what I'm saying and the simulation hypothesis of, of Nick Bostrom. So I've been very interested in the nature of consciousness. How is what are conscious experiences like the taste of chocolate, the smell of garlic, you know, the feeling of anger, all these, these experiences that we have, um, what are they? Can we have a theory of them? And how are they related to space time? 99% of my colleagues, so I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, and most of my colleagues who are studying this question uh, make the assumption that space and time is fundamental. And that in the case of humans, probably neurobiology or embodied neurobiology. So brains in, in a body, in an environment, is responsible for the creation of our conscious experiences. And so they're trying to figure out scientifically precise theories about how particular kinds of patterns of neural activity or activity of, of functional systems more generally. So integrated information theory doesn't need to have neurons. It could have perhaps some other kind of um, physical instantiation. Global workspace theory, similar, they could have some kind of computer architecture with the right, you know, structural and, and, comp and computational features that would then somehow presumably give rise to consciousness. So they're starting with things in space and time and trying to boot up consciousness. I, I gave that up because our best science tells us space time isn't fundamental and the particles, you know, like the quarks, the, the leptons, the bosons, and, and, and so forth that, that we see as part of the, the fundamental furniture of the universe from the, the space-time point of view is not fundamental. So we might as well be trying to boot up consciousness from earth, air, fire, and water. Those aren't fundamental either. So if we're starting with something that's not fundamental, good luck. So, so I decided, uh, I, in some sense, took a tip from Steven Pinker in his book, um, Enlightenment Now, he points out that he likes the global workspace theory of, of consciousness, but he says, you know, the last bit of that theory, though, that it actually feels like something to be that global workspace state, it feels like a headache or it feels like the taste of chocolate or whatever it might be. He says, we may just have to stipulate that, that connection. We'll just have to stipulate the conscious experiences. And I think Steve is right. I think that all of these functionalist and physicalist, also panpsychist and dualist theories um, have to stipulate the conscious experiences, they do not follow from anything inside the space-time physics at all. They don't follow at all. So my attitude is, as a scientist, I want the fewest assumptions. This is called Occam's razor, right? Get the fewest possible assumptions. So if, as Pinker says, and I agree, we have to stipulate conscious experiences, then I say, with a nod to William of Occam, stipulate nothing else, nothing else, just the conscious experiences and their dynamics. So that's what I'm, when I say I'm starting with a theory in which consciousness is fundamental, basically what I'm saying is all the other theories have to eventually just stipulate consciousness. So I'm stipulating consciousness too. But what I'm doing differently is I'm, I'm not stipulating space and time. I'm going to force myself to boot up space and time 
as a user interface that some conscious agents use, but that most don't. I mean, space-time is not special. We only see in three dimensions. Why not five? Why not 20? Why not a billion? Why do we need the notion of dimension at all? Maybe something just topological without any notion of dimension. Once you start to think outside of space-time, you realize that conscious agents, whether you know, I'm calling conscious agents, this, it's a formal structure of these, these entities beyond space-time that have perceptions. Um, conscious agents could use uh, space-time as a headset, but they don't have to. They could use countless other headsets. So, so where we are on that, I mean, you asked me how far have we gotten on that? What we have to do, well, first, we, we have a published theory of this. So people who want to see the mathematics, there's a paper called Objects of Consciousness. So if you just Google Objects of Consciousness and my name, there's a paper about Chetan Prakash, who's a mathematician and friend and collaborator. And I have this paper, which just presents the basic mathematical model. What we're doing now is trying to show how we can boot up space time and compute scattering amplitudes. So like particle collisions at the Large Hadron Collider from a theory of conscious agents. And, and the way we're heading is, is as follows. And this is very different from what my colleagues are doing. My colleagues start with the physics. And they say, well, these are the laws of quantum field theory, whatever the physics might be. Sometimes they just use Newton's. They say quantum isn't even relevant. And then they say, and somehow we're going to get consciousness coming out of all this, these complicated laws and dynamics and so forth. I'm going the other direction. I'm saying space time isn't fundamental. The physicists, however, have found some structures beyond space time. Maybe my theory of consciousness can connect with these deeper structures beyond space time that the physicists are finding. So what they found, this is one big thread. There's the amplitudehedron, which is this geometric structure and the volumes of portions of this give you the actual probabilities, the what they call amplitudes, but the probabilities, like if two gluons smash each other into each other at the Large Hadron Collider, what's the probability that four gluons go you know, spraying out in this way? So for all the particle collisions that you can imagine, you can get a volume in the amplitudehedron that gives you the probability or the amplitudes for, for those. So, so there's this amplitudehedron, which is doing this amazing stuff. It's not inside space-time. And by the way, when you do it in space-time, the one I mentioned, two gluons in, four gluons out, hundreds of pages of algebra for that one collision if you do it in space-time. If you do it with the amplitudehedron, you let go of space-time, one term. You can compute it by hand. So the math, when you let go of space-time, the math becomes beautiful and simple, and you get you get to see new symmetries. So there's a real another hint. I mean, our, our physics theory has already told us that it's over for space-time. It, it doesn't last plus past the Planck scale. But now the deeper theories are saying, wow, when you let go of space-time, things start to get beautiful. There's symmetries and things get simpler, um, but there's no dynamics. The physicists have no dynamics beyond space-time. They're just these monoliths you know these geometric monoliths sitting out there like in 2001 a space odyssey it's just sitting there and we're, we're, we're the monkeys jumping around looking at these things what are they telling us what are these monoliths beyond space time telling us now behind the amplitudehedron the deepest thing they found believe it or not are permutations like if i if i take the numbers one two and three i can change them into three two and one two one three and so forth there's six permutations of three numbers the permutations they found are slightly a little bit more fancy they're called decorated permutations you always permute to the right you you don't it's like if if i have one two and three if i make three go to one well i've sort of permuted to the left i've permuted to a lesser number so what you have to do is you have to always permute to the right so you if you have n numbers you permute in one to two n but anyway it's a permutation so it turns out that Basically, all of the physical information in the amplitudehedron and all the information needed to compute these scattering amplitudes is contained in these decorated permutations. And in some cases, you need to add something called helicities. But that's it. So that gave us a real target. We said, the physicists are saying, if you can hook into us and give us decorated permutations, we'll take you all the way into space time. We don't have to, so I don't have to do that work. The physicists have already done that work. So our theory is a theory in which the, the, if we have N conscious agents, you know, three or five or 100 conscious agents, we can model a simplified version of their interactions with an N by N matrix. So, so 
So, and all possible n by n matrices are all possible interactions of those n agents. So, so in other words, for for us, a simplified model of all, say, of five conscious agents interacting is the set of all five by five Markovian matrices. A Markovian matrix is a, a matrix who each row sums to one. So every row, if you take all the numbers in each row, each row sums to one. That's a Markovian matrix or Markovian kernel. So, so it turns out for every, for like for five conscious agents, interacting, you want the set of all five by five Markovian kernels. So it's called the Markov polytope, M sub five. So you have this polytope M sub five. For N agents, it's M sub N. So you have, you know, a, a, and, and it goes, the dimension grows very, very quickly. With just three agents, you already have 27 vertices. By the time you get to five agents, you have over 3,000 vertices. The, the, it, the complexity of this thing gets, it blows up very, very quickly. But just in the last month, we, Apparently, this is, we can't find any literature on this as prior. We have a, a new mathematics that shows how to assign a decorated permutation to every Markovian kernel. So that's a brand new piece of math. And we were motivated to find it because of what the physicists have done, and we were trying to connect with the physics. So looking at that, we discovered, and we'll be, we're, uh, I'll be presenting it at, at a conference in Stanford in a couple of weeks, uh, presenting the math on it. And then we, we have a paper that's already um, getting prepared for a journal called Entropy, where we present this decorated permutation. So we have a way of mapping um, the agent dynamics into decorated permutations. But but now, even more interesting, it turns out that when you look at the three by three, the M3, which is the Markov polytope of, of, of three agents, we think we have a mapping into what the physicists are calling um, for their, what they have, the, for each decorated permutation, they can create what's called an on-shell diagram. It, it's it's a kind of um, diagram which you have black and white vertices, which sort of are encoding for the permutation. So you, it turns out with every permutation, you can write one of these like on-shell diagrams, and it, it it's a bitar. It's called a playbook graph sometimes, a, a planar um, with black and white dots. And for them, the, the black and white dots are primitives. So they're the, the primitives of their entire thing, their whole edifice is a white dot has three edges in it coming into it, and a black dot has three edges coming into it. And you put these things together, and when you do that, you get every possible scattering event, like the two gluons in, four gluons out, and anything you want to, it's always made out of these black and white dots. We think that there's a mapping from M3, where half of M3, this Markov polytope, maps to what they call the white dots, and the other half maps to the black dots. This is what we're working on, actually, as, as of this morning. So, so what we're up to is to show that behind the structures that physicists have found, the amplitude hedron and these um, on-shell diagrams, there, which are all static, these are all static things, there is this much richer dynamical world of this Markov these Markovian kernels that gives a much richer and much more nuanced thing, where they have just one white vertex, in one black vertex, we have a polytope with 27 vertices, an incredible interior structure, half of which gets compressed into what they call the white vertex, and half of which gets compressed in what they call the black vertex. So what we're finding is a dynamical system of consciousness beyond what the physicists are finding. So that's what we're on to right now, is we're trying to show that we can start with the theory of conscious agents and map all the way into space-time. But I should say now how it's different from the standard simulation theory. Anybody who knows simulation theory can already hear from what I'm saying, but this is, this is a, a very, very different point of view. In simulation theory, the idea is that we're not the fundamental reality. We're just actually some characters in someone's computer program. So there's this some programmer somewhere that is really clever and wrote this really complicated simulation, and we're just we and our consciousness and our whole world around us is really just nothing but a computer program. And it turns out that that programmer that did that is herself just another character in a deeper program. So there's a deeper level program, and so you can keep going all the way down. And But at the bottom is a space-time world. So the way that the, this is typically thought of in the simulation theory is yes, space and time are fundamental, the physics is fundamental that way, and we're booting up um, consciousness, your consciousness, my consciousness, is all being booted up somehow by complicated 
uh, programs in computers. Now, so I'm, I'm saying I differ in, in, in a couple of ways. I'm saying I disagree that we should start with space time because the physicists tell us that space time isn't fundamental. Why would I disagree with the physicists? They're the experts that say space time is doomed. So space time is doomed. I don't want to start my simulation theory on something that's doomed. So I, so I part with simulation theory because of the physics that says space time is doomed. So the bottom level of prog programmer cannot be in space and time. We need something beyond that. Otherwise, we're just ignoring what physicists tell us. And second, the, the problem is that if you start with a computer program and you try to get consciousness coming out of it, then you have what's called the hard problem of consciousness. How does my feeling of conscious experience of, say, the taste of garlic or the smell of a rose come from a computer program? That's the very thing that Pinker, Stephen Pinker, is saying we have to stipulate, and I agree with him. So, so the simulation theorists uh, are they're starting with space and time, which is doomed, and they're saying that we're going to give you consciousness, but they have to stipulate it. So there's no beef. They have the wrong foundation, and there's no beef in terms of consciousness. There's it's, it's stipulation. So that's why what I'm doing, although it sounds superficially like simulation theory, is completely different. I'm saying right up front, we stipulate conscious experiences as the foundation of our theory, and I'll show you how space-time comes out as one trivial head, headset out of countless others that are much more interesting that the consciousness can use. Super interesting. So this, a lot of this sounds like things that were not in the book. So these are like newer things. Where can I yes. find, uh, you know, uh, do you have them like written somewhere that I can uh, dig deeper into? Yes, um, we have a first draft of this paper. We'll probably have a draft that I would be happy to give to you. It'll be close enough in probably about four weeks. So this is what we're what we're doing right now. Um, and I've only mentioned this in in a few very recent podcasts that I've only I've only done in the last month, and they, they're probably not even posted yet. So I have actually mentioned this in some podcasts that are going to be coming up. But you're you're, you're right. Um, even the idea that I've just mentioned, I, I didn't even have that in my um, podcast with Lex Friedman, um, which was yeah. I did in June. Yeah. We've been making some some big progress. I mean, we're, we're pretty excited. We we only discovered the decorated permutations, the, the, how we get assigned every Markov chain, or I'm sorry, every Markov kernel, a decorated permutation about four weeks ago. That's that's when we discovered that. And, and then we just discovered this mapping of the black and white vertices onto uh, M3, the, the Markov polytool, uh, which is a six dimensional polytool. We only discovered that this week. So that's that's this week that we discovered that. So so we're we're really moving quickly on trying to start with conscious agents and and get a pontoon bridge into space time. Mm -hmm. and, and this black and white vertex thing is really exciting to me because if if that holds up, it shows that what's just black and white for physicists has all sorts of shades of gray and nuance for us. And so that's what you really want. This, so it's not like we're we're taking consciousness and trying to shoehorn it into what the physics has already done. It's the other way around. We're saying if you start with consciousness, we're going to enrich the entire framework in which physics is done. So it, it, we're turning things all around. The panpsychists try to shoehorn consciousness into the physics. I'm saying no. We're going to show that physics is a trivial case of this much deeper and more nuanced dynamics of consciousness. Okay, my mind is blown a little bit because um, I can see that your, you, you know, I can I can hear in your voice the excitement of something that you've just discovered, but I yes. think I'm gonna push you a little bit sure. to try and make it uh, simpler, understandable. Because, sure. you know, like something like the the Bostrom, uh, you know, simulation uh, theory is quite easy to understand in in many ways. Right. Um, what you're discussing here is is a lot more complex. So um, let me first get a couple of things out of the way. Do you know Leon Leonard uh, Saskind? Well, I, I know of his work and I've seen some okay. of his videos. I, I haven't met him, but yes. So um, you know about his holographic uh, idea yes. of the nature of reality. Is this kind of close to that, what you're talking about with... Um, with the uh, going beyond space and time? No, it's not. So the typical holographic work that's being done right now in, in, in physics is the so-called ADS-CFT um, correspondence. So anti-de-sitter space and, and uh, conformal field theory. 
and and there is it's a beautiful piece of mathematics um, that 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 he um, was one of the first to think would be there, and then Juan Maldacena was sort of the first to really make it uh, absolutely precise and, and show that there was this ADS CFT correspondence, and what it, what they find is that a a theory that has gravity. So an anti an anti de Sitter space with gravity um, corresponds to a a space of dimension one less without gravity that has just a conformal field theory on it. So there's so so you can do quantum field theory on the boundary, and then you can go to what they call the bulk, which has one dimension higher, and it looks like you also have gravity. So so you get this nice duality now. Um, as, as beautiful and as impressive as that is, time on the boundary is the same as time in the bulk. So they haven't dealt with time. We're, we're having to, so you, you have to get out of space time completely. And, they, and, and by the way, I'm not saying anything that Suskin doesn't know. Suskin would be the first to not only say this, but also correct me and go into far more nuance. So, so I, I, I'm not teaching Suskin anything or, or the physics anything. So this, I'm just saying this you know for everybody else they know that they're that we don't live in an anti-de-sitter space as well we live in what they're closer to what they call a de-sitter space and they know that the time on the holographic boundary that they're working on is the same as the time in the bulk so so they know all these i mean so they're not learning anything from this cognitive scientist i'm just doing this for the benefit of, of the podcast so what we're doing is is um trying to go entirely outside of space and time just like the amplitudehedron goes entirely outside of space and time. And, and the decorated permutations behind the amplitudehedron are entirely outside of space and time. That's what we have to do. So that, that's why it's different than the holographic thing. It, it is similar in the sense that we still, I still think of space time as merely a nice little convenient headset that, that conscious agents use. And I, I should say, because you wanted me to unpack this a little bit, um, when, when I talk about conscious agents, they're, they're, the conscious agent is a precise mathematical structure that is in that paper, Objects of Consciousness, that I mentioned, so people can look it up. And it turns out when you look at that mathematical structure, you can essentially think of these agents as little units that you can network together. You can network agents together. So you have this vast social network, like the Twitterverse, and, and conscious agents are tweeting and following each other. And the mathematics says that when two agents, uh, when you, whenever you have a pair of agents, um, they satisfy the definition of an agent. So there's actually any combination of agents is also an agent. So that's one thing that, that comes out of this. The other thing is it's trivial to show that these conscious agent networks are computationally universal. So anything that you could do on a computer or a, a neural network, you can also do on a network of conscious agents. But they're also, they're not um, limited to computation because the it turns out the, the Markovian kernels, um, the, the measurable spaces on which they're defined can have elements that are not computable. You're not required to have computable um, measurable sets in, in, your, in your sigma algebra. So, so it goes beyond computation. But anyway, so it, think of this way. You can think of conscious agents as a network where any two agents themselves constitute an, an agent. So it's fractal, like it, it's self-similar in that sense. It, it's just it goes up and down. Whenever you have agents, they form a new agent uh, and up, all the way up and down. It's, it's anything you can do with a neural net, you can do with a conscious agent net, you can compute anything. So, so by the way, our conscious agents, we define them as very, very simple things. They have experiences and they can probabilistically affect other experiences. End of story. That's all that's part of that. So, so that. so there's no notion of a self. There's no notion of learning, memory, problem solving, intelligence, none of that. For that, we have to build networks. So our basic definition of a conscious agent has only, there are raw experiences and somehow raw experiences probabilistically affect other raw experiences. And we use Markovian kernels for those probabilities. That's all we assume. Everything else about consciousness has to be built up. And that's in the spirit of science. You take the minimal assumptions and then force yourself to do all the work, including all the work to build up space-time. So I don't want to stipulate space-time, I'm going to build it. 
Um, and that's why we did these decorated permutations for all the kernels that sort of model the conscious agent dynamics. For each kernel, I can give you a decorated permutation. From the decorated permutations, we can go into space time. So, so it's, that's a different, a little bit different uh, point of view on this. Okay. So these conscious agents, they are completely outside of space time. That's right. And completely. And how do they, how do they relate to our consciousness? So very, very interesting. Uh, it, it turns out that my consciousness, for example, or your consciousness is more complicated than we might think. I was friends with a fellow named Joe Bogan, a surgeon, who did a number of surgeries on people where he went, it was brain surgery, and he cut the corpus callosum in half. So your, your brain has two hemispheres, a left and a right hemisphere, and they're connected by a cable called the corpus callosum. It has about 220 million axons, a little bit more in women than men. The, the women are better connected than men. but he for people with epilepsy that was intractable the drugs couldn't cure it they they did this surgery as a last resort to help these poor people because if you had an epileptic focus in the left hemisphere if you cut the corpus callosum you could keep the right hemisphere from from being destroyed by you know you're going not destroyed but going through the seizure and it worked so you I mean joe's surgeon surgery worked you cut the corpus callosum if the left hemisphere went into a seizure the in general the right hemisphere would not but what they found was the two hemispheres now, in careful experiments, have different consciousnesses, separate consciousnesses. So I can have a person in which, with a very simple experiment, I, I have the person looking at a screen, I flash up the phrase key ring. Key is to the left of where they're looking, and ring is to the right of where they're looking. They're looking at some dot on the screen. So I flash up key ring. The right hemisphere will see and be conscious of the word key, but not the word ring. And the left hemisphere will be conscious and see the word ring, but not the word key. And so you will have a person in which the right hemisphere is conscious of key and the left hemisphere is conscious of ring, and nobody is conscious of key ring. And if you ask the person to pick up with their left hand what they saw, they'll pick up a key. If you pick up with the right hand, they'll pick up a ring. And if you then go pro further, it, it, uh, my friend Vyas Ramakandran, a professor at UC San Diego, found that in one of his patients, I think it was the left hemisphere uh, believed in God and the right hemisphere was an atheist. So they not only have different conscious experiences, they have different religious beliefs and, and in fact, different goals in life. Uh, one guy's left hemisphere wanted to be a, a draftsman and the right hemisphere wanted to be a, a race car driver. So, so you're not just one conscious agent, you're two. Uh, and there, we see them as, in our interface as two hemispheres connected by a cable, but then you're more, you're, you're an infinite lattice of conscious agents. So, so the, the one agent that we call SOMI has actually got two conscious agents that probably have different goals in life. And, and we all have two hemispheres with different goals. And so that's why on a Friday night when I want either to party or to study, you know, I, I, maybe one hemisphere wants one and what, the other hemisphere wants the other. So, and then there's just conscious agents all the way down. So that's, that's, so so you are a conscious agent, but you're also two conscious agents, and you're also an, an unbounded, perhaps, lattice of, of interacting conscious agent in a scale-free fashion. So actually, in that sense, you could say that you're a different conscious agent every day. You know, you're a different conscious agent every moment because every no two moments are the same. You know, depending and and as you said, that these um, conscious agents. Uh, they collide or, or you know, they um, join forces and, and as they do, they create new conscious uh, agents. So, so based on the kind of environment that you put yourself in or the kind of people that you hang out with, you know, every, every moment is a different. So, so in that sense, you could say that um, the entirety of uh, the experience of life is just a lot of conscious agent moments. That, that's right. And, and we might say, well, but I know better than that because I see a lot of things that aren't conscious agents. I see rocks, I see dirt, I see walls. Those are surely not conscious agents. But, but remember, the, the idea here is that the reality is all this big network of conscious agents. And because there's an infinite number of conscious agents, you need some way to dumb it down where you can you know, interact with it. So we have a headset, what we call space and time, and headsets dumb things down. 
So if I see a rock, that uh, doesn't mean that I'm interacting with something that's not conscious. I'm interacting with something that's that's conscious, but my my interface has to give up. So so like right now on my screen, I have some pixels that are pixels for your face. So there are they, I call them the SOMI pixels because they're giving me information about your face. And, and I'm learning something about your consciousness from those pixels. But there are other pixels I see like your desk. So I see a, a drawer on a desk. Well, those pixels aren't doing anything. It, but, so are there conscious pixels and unconscious pixels? Well, that's stupid, right? It's, it, they're all pixels of an interface. It's just that some pixels give me insight into SOMI's consciousness and others give me no insight there. You know, they're the no insight. But, but it's always consciousness on the other side. So the pixels are not conscious. So rocks are not conscious or unconscious. Human bodies are not conscious or unconscious. They're just interface symbols. The consciousness is on the other side of the interface. It's behind. So we tend to think of ourselves as a little tiny consciousness in this big space time. I'm saying reverse the whole picture. Consciousness is fundamental. Space time is a little data structure inside of you. It's, it's a, the containment is the other direction. We thought that we were contained in space time. No, space time is a trivial little data structure that you use, but you're far vaster than that trivial data structure. So you have to reverse the whole thing around. So you're always interacting with consciousnesses. And so this gives us a different attitude to who we are as human beings too, right? You, you said we, you're interested in this because we could lead to new technology, but also to the meaning of why are we here and what's this about? Well, well the answer. Mm -hmm. No, go yeah. ahead. So I was going to say that the um, two things. One, one is that the way that we dumb it down is through stories, right? So, so the entirety of life is stories, right? And as we are creating this new metaverse, we are creating new possibilities for creating stories. You know, like if we are already wearing a headset, we are adding more functionality to our headset um, to create new experiences, right? Look, I'm, I'm very deeply involved in the Web3 community and, um, you know, the, the whole metaverse um, experience. And I'm, I'm just trying to better understand, are we making it more intelligent or less intelligent? by wearing this extra headset? I think it's up to us. I think that we can make headsets. It's just like movies. Will movies enhance our intellect or will they denigrate us and, and degrade us? And I can find movies of both kinds. Like I, there are movies I can point to where I sit in a movie and I come out of it a better person and my mind is expanded and other movies I come out. And, and so I think the it's up to us. We can make metaverses where where we in fact, enhance connection with other people beyond what we could have. And we enhance people's um, consciousness and we enhance um, community or we can do the opposite. So it's, 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 it's completely flexible. We may even be able to use um, virtual reality to change the abilities of our very senses. Uh, a, a friend of mine, Mike, Mike Desmura, a professor in my department, um, had some students, this is now 20 years ago, uh, I think, um, trying to see if we put people in uh, VR where it's a four-dimensional game. So you had to play, so they created a four-dimensional world and you had to hunt and, and try to find these creatures that were trying to find you in a four-dimensional world. And, and so they did this and, and the, the question was, if you spend a number of hours in a 4D metaverse, would you eventually learn to see in four dimensions instead of just three dimensions? And uh, so I was, so this is, it's not state of the art. I mean, this was 20 years ago or so, or so. And they did find that people got better and better. I was on the dissertation committees of, of some of these people and I let them get their PhDs. I never believed that, that these people actually saw in 4D that not, but what might make me a believer is if, and we can't do this um, for obvious, humanitarian and, and ethical reasons. But if we took an infant from birth and put them in a 4D headset, I would not be surprised if they could actually learn to see in 4D. So if, if we could somehow get people early enough and get informed consent and so forth, I think we might be able to actually enhance 
our our senses. It, it, you know, how helpful would it be if we could visualize in 4D instead of 3D? That would be incredible. So, so I think the possibilities are are endless, um, and uh, and I think it'll go both ways. I think that we'll see, and we see it all the time. We're, we're doing trivial stuff with our our technology, and then we're doing stuff that really raises the human level, and and so. It's up to us what we want to do with it. You know, uh, Erwin Schrodinger talked about um, his idea of what is life, right? And, and I talk about it in my book, as I uh, actually reference him. Um, it really resonates with me. Essentially, basically, what, like the dumbed down version of it is that, I'm sure you know, that essentially uh, since the beginning of the Big Bang, life has been going towards a, a state of maximum entropy or the universe has been going towards a state of maximum entropy. And then in this process, random particles get together and they, uh, they form, uh, you know, some form of order. And as they do that, they try to overcome entropy. And then w when those um, agents, those, those particles, you know, that have those clusters, let's say, uh, those clusters of par particles, when they become aware of what they're doing, that's where intelligent life has happened. Does that picture make sense to you? Uh, or how, how will that work in your, like where does entropy fall into this new way of looking at uh, consciousness? I can give a mathematically precise answer. Okay. So it's possible for us to write down a dynamics of conscious agents in which the entropy does not increase. It's easy to do. So, so we can have a dynamics of conscious agents in which there is no increasing entropy. So there's no entropic time, but it's a theorem and you can prove the theorem. It's only like, it's a trivial proof, three-step proof. Any projection of that dynamics, say by conditional probability, will necessarily, so you have this, you have this dynamics of conscious agents, there's no entropic time. I'm not projecting it, it's an information losing map so I'm getting a new version of that dynamics, right? I'm getting a, a projected dynamics. That dynamics that's projected will have increasing entropy. So I'm trying to understand. Yeah. So you can write a theorem that doesn't have entropy. Is that- we'll Write a dynamics. The, sorry, okay, the, the that, dynamics of consciousness. That, that doesn't right. have entropy. And then what happens that the second one has entropy? Any way that you look at it, where you're losing information by looking at it, by projection, say, uh -huh. you will, in your projected view of it, you will see it as having an arrow of time, an entropic arrow of time, but it's an artifact of your projection. So it's not, it's not the truth. So, so what, I, what I'm proposing is- actually here, happen. That's right. You that's right. I think it. that right, that's right. So the Big Bang and increasing entropy is not a fundamental insight into reality. It's merely an artifact of our particular headset projection. That's all. And so okay. the whole framework of, so time is the, the, the fundamental limited resource that we have. So all the limited resources that, that drive evolution, limited food and, and water and mates and the whole bit, all those limited resources are probably just an artifact of projection. They're not, so what I would like to see, so even though I, I'm, I love evolution by natural selection, it's a beautiful theory. I use evolutionary game theory to show that we don't see reality as it is. What would be really beautiful is to show that with this theory of conscious agents, I can get evolution by natural selection as a artifact of projection. So the conscious agents, there is no competition, perhaps, no limited resource, no entropic time. But when you take a projection of it, you get evolutionary game theory. You get limited resources, you get entropic time as an artifact of that projection. So that's how I see it coming out. And that's how I see all of our science coming out. All of our current science mm -hmm. will come out as artifacts of projection of the deeper dynamics of conscious agents, all of it. Okay, so I think I've just had an epiphany. So essentially, if, every, if, if this understanding that we have of entropy is the result of the headset that we are wearing, if we wanted to get rid of entropy, we would need to take off that headset and wear a different headset. Basically, all I wanted to know was that, can I still right. wear the same headset and stay young? 
<laughs> it sounds I, like I, I can. I think not. <laughs> I, 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 my guess is, uh, first I should say I don't, I, I don't know. So I should be very, very clear that to say I don't know. But my guess right now would be that um, if you, well, it's, it's actually, I guess, the theorem of this that I, that I just mentioned, the theorem. If, if you don't want to have increasing entropy, then you have to see the whole thing. Not you can't have a headset. You have to embrace the whole thing. And now, what's interesting about that is now we come up against Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Because what does it mean to see the whole thing? What does it mean to see the whole thing? Because what if you can all you can do is take off one one headset and put on another headset, but you can never get out of the headset. Right. It, 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 exactly. So that, so that's so by a headset. Now I'm thinking of of I'm thinking of a headset as a formal system. So, so think of it as a formal system. So I'm, I'm projecting whatever reality is into like pixels or more mathematically you just like some mathematical framework. And so you could change anytime you use a mathematical framework and project reality into it, then you're going to get this problem that the, the entropy will always appear to increase. But Gödel's incompleteness theorem tells us that reality the truths of, of reality always transcend any formal system so no matter how what there's no scientific theory of everything no matter how big our theory is Gödel says i'll always find new things that are true but but can't be derived from your theory so in other words the reality beyond any headset is unlimited it's unbounded and no amount of headsets girdles incompleteness theorem is telling us that no headset could ever do it and no no collection of headsets can ever do it and so this now gets to your other question which is the meaning of life and and who we are and so forth and and again i don't know i don't know the meaning of life i don't know what we are i i don't know but so i will just say what the best ideas are that I have so far from this this new framework, but at least at least it will be different. <laughs> I think that our awareness. So I'm taking consciousness as fundamental, and the math that we're working on basically says there's one consciousness because anytime there's consciousness interacting, they form one consciousness. So there is this one awareness. And this awareness can have content or not. If you meditate, you can let go of any content. So you can't put on a headset to know the truth. Any headset will necessarily screen the truth down into some little formal system. And Gödel tells us that you've lost almost an infinite, well, you've lost an infinite amount of truth. The only way to know the truth is not conceptually or perceptually, it's by being the truth without concepts and without sensation. So this is where science and spirituality seemed now to, to dovetail, that, that what the spiritual traditions have been saying for thousands of years, the science is, is now, I think, saying the same thing. But the, it's not just that science is Johnny-come-latelys to the party. We are. We're Johnny-come-latelys. But we can say it far more precisely. And so, so this is a real convergence of science and spirituality that I really find exciting. And so I'm looking forward to having spiritual traditions and, you know, mining these spiritual traditions and talking with spiritual people for their insights, because they've been there beyond space time for thousands of years. But they haven't had the tools to make those insights precise. Science has the tools to make those insights precise. So the two have half of the picture. And we can put the two together and start to really move forward as a species, as, as conscious agents in this particular headset to you know, see outside of our headset and, and maybe wake up, as the spiritual traditions say, to, yeah, space time has been just a headset and we are this um, infinite or unbounded uh, awareness and, and intelligence that goes beyond any particular headset. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I, I'm aware that we are at time. Um, what I would love to do is, if if I may, uh, I'd love to read your uh, new paper, um, if I can have it when, when you're ready to share. And then maybe in a few months time, when I've uh, digested it properly, I'd love to have you back 
and I'd love to dig a little bit more deeper into this metaverse um you know area that we are going into and kind of like better understand um how it all um could relate to the kind of new experiences that we are creating because um you know for example uh people like Larry Page you know he he believes that carbon life is not the only life that matters and that silicon life is is um just as important as uh you know so I'm, I'm really fascinated by the possibility that we are potentially creating a new kind of conscious agent, you know, like in AI uh, and in this new metaverse world that we are going to go into. And that that new kind of conscious agent is potentially going to, not potentially, it is going to interact with the kind of conscious agents that we are. And what does that all mean? I feel like something really important is happening in this century um, you know, I call myself a transition architect, you know, like we are, I feel like in this century, something really important is happening. We are coming up to uh, a new understanding of uh, our consciousness and, and uh, artificial intelligence kind of meeting. Uh, one, one thing that we didn't discuss today, and maybe next time when we speak, I, uh, we can go a little bit deeper into, but I have always um, had this kind of um, conjecture that maybe, you know, we are not using technology maybe technology is using us you know we are always mm. thinking like uh that we are if, if you ask you know what is what is technology the, the typical meaning of it is that technology is a set of tools and techniques that enhance our abilities um but actually another way of looking at it is that technology is a life form in itself and it's using us to further itself mm. you know so 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 there are, um, there, yeah, there's quite a lot to, um, uh, to dig deeper into. So I, I'd like to uh, really read your new material. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I need to listen to this a few times and I uh, uh, look forward to reading your new material and I hope to talk to you again. I would, I would really enjoy meeting again with you and talking about these ideas. It'd be a lot of fun. This has been a great pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Donald Hoffman. I will definitely have him back on the podcast. Be sure to read his excellent book, The Case Against Reality, and listen to his TED Talk. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it on Apple, Spotify, or any other one of your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to give it a five-star rating and write a review. The full interviews are also available on my YouTube channel, The Somi Ariane Show.